This is Generous Theology. Chuck and Brock are together looking at the works of Herman Bavink, Reformed Dogmatics, Volume 1. I'm Brock, and Chuck, we have a chance to be in Chapter 11 of Volume 1 of Bavink's Reformed Dogmatics, and it's about special revelation. This is part of Bavink's Part 4, and the section we're looking at tonight is Professor Bavink considering revelation as God's self revelation. And this is a very interesting chapter. Chuck, we've been talking about what what about the idea of revelation? It, you know, it's, it's one of the kippium, one of the foundations of Reformed theology, that God exists and that God has disclosed knowledge of himself to us. And we've talked about the general revelation of God. We've talked about how over time God spoke to to people in various times, in diverse and sundry manners, as Hebrews uh, chapter 1 indicates. And yet, finally, God has spoken to us in these last days through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the idea here is that God has spoken by incarnating Christ as God in, in human form, and that is the surpassing great revelation of all time. Now, in support of that actual enfleshment of God. And by the way, Chuck, how can, how can an infinite God become a human being? What a mystery. But having said that, we also have this written word, these holy scriptures, this special revelation that, that reveals to us this God who has come into our reality as a human, and he came on a very specific mission. And so the this is a preeminent history-defining moment. Chuck, I, I had the chance to eat pizza over the weekend, and Chuck, I love to eat pizza, and I can talk about eating pizza a lot, but, but it's not a history-defining moment. And when you and I read in the Holy Scriptures that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and then finally the Word became flesh, Chuck, that is the pivotal revelation in all of history. And so we're talking about something quite special indeed here. Now, with respect to this, what did you think of Professor Bavink's approach, how he laid it out? He, he, he spoke in several different sections underneath this, in creation to fallen humanity as triune God, salvation as focal point, and then Trinitarian glory as a goal. And what did you think of that organization, and what were some of the, some of the points that really caught your eye? You know, first of all, it, it is interesting to me that this next section, Revelation is God's self-revelation, is part of the chapter on special revelation. But I think it, it transcends, to some extent, that that section. And, and what I mean is this, not that it doesn't belong there, I, I think it does, and not that he, he could have put it in perhaps the next chapter, I suppose he, he could have, but... What what he does in speaking about revelation as God's self-revelation is he now takes what he's talked about as far as general revelation, and he takes what he's talked about as special revelation, and he puts them together as a way of showing how they work together as revelation in general, as God's self-revelation, as, as God telling his creatures, his people, who he is. And and so we start with, you know, again, in creation, this sense of natural or general revelation, but that there's there's so much more to it, and that even in, in special revelation, we have a sense of God's self-revelation in creation, right? That God tells us about he he is the creator, he's the maintainer, he's the ruler of all things. It's in the light of Scripture that we know it is the Father who by his word and spirit reveals himself in the works of nature and history. And so he he ties these two things together here. And then as he moves on in these various sections as well that you've referred to, revealing himself to fallen humanity as triune God, salvation being the focal point, etc., he does that same that same thing where he, in essence, takes what he has explained about general revelation and what he's, you know, explicated regarding a special revelation, and he ties it all back in together as well. 
always maintaining th that, you know, there is both that we need, both general and special revelation. But that special revelation is, in fact, special in that it holds a special place. And it is really only through special revelation that we learn the gospel story, the the sort of the story arc of Scripture being really the key to, to who we are and the key to who God is. And it's only, we only learn that that story arc of, of creation and fall and redemption and restoration. We only learn that through through Scripture, even though we can buttress all sorts of things with that, with things that we learn in in general revelation. And and I just in in a lot of ways, yes, this sort of ties things together that he's already said. And so in some ways it's a summing up. But in other ways, I think this is really the heart of these two chapters that we've spent the last few weeks talking about. It it really brings it all together in a way that that we can understand. And there are some real key some real key points I think that that we read in these paragraphs that I think um, really are at the heart of what we believe about Scripture. I'm wondering, did you get that same impression? And and if so, what were some of the some of the key pithy takeaways that 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 you that you saw in in these paragraphs yeah yeah thank you thank you for that so i think one of the first things that impressed me so first of all you mentioned one of the things that impressed me and that is in this chapter chapter 11 in this section revelation as god's self revelation there is a flow to the sections, and you noted that. So Professor Bavink gives us five bullet points. The first is that God's self-revelation happens in creation. And then secondly, it is directed to, it is given to fallen humanity. Now, third point is that God reveals himself as the triune God. Now, Chuck, many people believe that truths about God can be derived scientifically, philosophically, uh, independently from the Holy Scriptures. For example, atheists very often say to me something like, let's have a discussion about your religion. I would love for you to prove your religion's truth to me, they'll say, without appeal to the Bible and without reference to the person of Jesus Christ. Now, as Professor Bavink notes, this idea of the self-revelation of God as triune God has never been anticipated. There's no philosopher. There's no ethicist. There's no moralist. There is no great thinker outside of the Holy Scriptures who anticipated that when Jesus Christ, God in flesh as human, came into this world, that he would reveal a triune God. And so special revelation gives us this focal point that we otherwise never would have had. And then finally, he talks about salvation as focal point, and this is the idea that the grand narrative, the theme, runs through all of the Scripture, is God's redemption of sinners. And then finally, to what end and for what purpose? Well, point five, Trinitarian glory is the goal. Now, with that in mind, there is a very interesting thing. Why come back? Why do we need the Scriptures? Now, I've already hinted that people did not anticipate the triune nature of God, which we now can hang our hats on because it's been revealed. But oftentimes I hear, okay, well, maybe we couldn't have figured out the Trinity, but why could we have not built a bridge from where we are to where we needed to be, to be acceptable and clean and good and right before God without the Scripture? Now, Professor Bavik says this, Holy Scripture teaches us that God very definitely, conscious and intentionally reveals himself in nature and history in the heart and conscience of human being, and adds to this that when people do not acknowledge and understand this revelation, this is due to the darkening of their mind, and therefore renders them inexcusable. And I think this is one of the key things that without special revelation, how could, how could the lost human being know himself to be lost? And so here it is, when people do not acknowledge and understand what God reveals in the creation that all of us can see. When astronomers study the stars, when physicists study quantum mechanics, when social engineers study social sciences, when people do not, when people do such activities but do not acknowledge and understand the God behind them all, 
This is not due to a lack of evidence. It's not due to science simply hasn't got there yet, but this is due to the darkening of the sinful human mind. And worse, such a darkening is not an occasion to plead ignorance. And I, I think there's the famous famous incantation along these lines from Bertrand Russell. And I'm, I'm going from memory here, so I'm paraphrasing. But someone asked Professor Russell, Professor, what, what should happen if after your death you appear before God and have to give an account for, your, for yourself, for your unbelief? And I think Professor Russell's response was something along the lines of, well, I should tell him that he did not give enough evidence. In other words, the fault was not in Professor Russell. The fault was in the God who simply didn't give evidence. And Chuck, this is a very common way that my non-believing friends think. They walk around and they say, my, my, my mind is bright, my eyes are clear, I have a clarity of thought about life, the universe, and the way things are, and now we Christians, armed with our special revelation, come to his house, knock on his door, and have the audacity to tell him that he thinks the way he thinks because his heart and mind are darkened. Now, without the scriptures and the revelation, how could we make this appeal? And so there's that urgency there, and I was really taken by that. Now, the other thing that really impressed me is how Professor Bobbing tied special revelation to general revelation. And he says this, ultimately nothing is excluded from general revelation. If our eyes were good, we would see God's attribute shine in all that is and all that happens. Accordingly, we best perceive the leading of God in the big and little occurrences of our own life. So, Chuck, that is, that's the way I would answer my atheist friend. He says, to, he says to me, well, I don't think my mind is darkened. I don't think there's something wrong or defective with me. I don't believe that I'm a sinner. And that's something that I think perhaps only a special revelation could address. So in the creation section, I think those were two of the points that just really overwhelmed me with how Professor Bovink ties it all together. Let me throw it back to you to build on that in that section and then maybe in the fallen humanity section as well. Yeah, you know, what's what's really interesting is I was I had pulled out uh, a copy of one of my other favorite systematic theologies, a, a one volume version entitled Reformational Theology, a New Paradigm for Doing Dogmatics by Gordon Spikeman. And uh, Spikeman wrote this really before Bavink was as available in the English language as as he is now. There were some things in the English language, but he wrote this book primarily during the 1980s, and I think it was published probably around 1991, 1992. And, and so he often uses Bavink to buttress things that, that he wants to point out. And in fact, in many ways, what he's doing is he's providing, he's providing Bavink to English language readers who didn't have him yet. And I, I was actually, I had pulled the book out for something else completely. But uh, as I was paging through it, I, I realized that uh, that Spikeman really gets into this very issue that, that you're talking about, about both how general and special revelation work together, and and also how they relate to the the listener the you know the subject the, the you know the human subject and and it's it's interesting here spikeman he he often uses for general revelation he'll talk about the creational word and and then he'll talk about special revelation as his word of redemption god's word of redemption and he points out that the creational word or general revelation remains God's first word for the world, and it's also his lasting word. God hasn't withdrawn it. It stands firm. It will endure to the end. It's lost nothing of its original holding power and clarity. The trouble lies on the response side. Therefore, though that first word is still sufficient for its original intent and purpose, it's no longer sufficient for our present need. That's because of our fall into sin. If we had we not fallen into sin, there'd be no need for special revelation. We would have general re revelation, and it would be specific. So thanks to God's condescending grace, Spikeman says, that first word, that creational word, is not God's last word. 
he reiterates his creational word in his word of redemption. There is no divine retraction. God did not retreat from his original stand. The beginning was this. God created the heavens and the earth, the Genesis story. And in the end, he will usher in the renewed earth in which righteousness dwells, the story of Revelation. But now there is also the redemptive sweep of history. The primeval garden becomes a city, the new Jerusalem. The paradise created and lost is regained and fulfilled. The plan of redemption is not a different plan, replacing the original plan of creation, the original blueprint still holds, redemption is, as it were, a mid-course correction, God pursuing his abiding goal in a sin-infested world via a detour. And then he goes on to quote Bavink, and, and because Bavink isn't much in English, he has to quote him secondarily, coming out of the book Nature and Grace in Bavink by Jan Wienhoff. But he quotes Bavink saying, the covenant of grace or redemption differs from the covenant of works, creation, in the road and not its final destination. The point of arrival returns to the point of departure and is simultaneously a high point elevated high above the point of departure. So the word of redemption or the special revelation comes to us as a reaffirmation or a republication of the word of creation or of, of general revelation. So they work completely together. There is really, in, in, in the end, no difference between them in terms of their content. The difference is in terms of how we can how we can respond to them and how we can understand the, the, the content they're in because of the fall into sin. And, you know, when, when, you, when you quote a philosopher as, as saying, well, I, you know, if I, I'm called before the throne of God to answer why I didn't, why I didn't believe, I'll say it's because you didn't give me enough evidence. There's going to be a very simple answer to that. And God's going to say, I gave you all the evidence you needed. The reason you didn't see it is because of the blindness of your own eyes, your own sin, your own depravity that prevented you from seeing it. And by the way, it's your own fault you didn't see it. And I provided you other ways to see it. I provided you this word of redemption. I provided you scripture and you didn't take that either. You know, it's like I, you, I did it once, you, 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 your sin prevented you from seeing it. I gave you another opportunity and you still didn't take it. And Spikeman then goes out to point out then that he thinks that the most fundamental issue in reform dogmatics is a right understanding of the relationship between creation and redemption. It's the relationship between general and special revelation, that there is a basic continuity which holds for our life in the world with respect to the structures of creation, the, the things that classic theology ascribes to common grace, things that conserve or preserve grace. But yet there's also a radical discontinuity with regard to the direction, and that's because of special grace. Our, our direction has changed because of our sin, but God's redemptive word in Scripture witnesses in Christ to the redirection of our misdirected lives. And so the biblical storyline reveals the movement from formation or creation through deformation or the fall and reformation, redemption, toward consummation or, or restoration. And I just, you know, as I, as I read that section from Spikeman, I thought, Man, I, I think he wrote this while he was reading this section that, that, that we're reading, and perhaps some other sections as well. But it is it is such a, in many ways, a summing up of of all that Bavink is, is saying here, and and it just struck me that there's there's yeah, it, it, it's really amazing how it's it's not just about and and Bavink picks up on this that it's not just about two kinds of of revelation, but they are two kinds of revelation that work inextricably with each other that aren't change that don't change anything and it is really a, a way of god once again keeping his promises to sinful humanity about his key, his covenant keeping to fallen humanity and you know we because we are fallen we 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 can't read general revelation the way that we should be. Our our spectacles are darkened because of sin, and yet God has provided this other revelation, this special revelation, this revelation of redemption, and and in its light we can see light. And uh, and that's just yeah, it's it's you know it's it's one of those things that as you read it you just go amen. You know here's the story of scripture and and it's all put together right here. Amen, indeed.
Chuck, I think one of the things that strikes me in that section about fallen humanity is going back to our citation of Professor Russell. Uh, I did not know Professor Russell, obviously. However, reading the works of his that I've read gives me the impression that, that had I met him when he was alive, he, he would have been very self-assured and confident in his atheism. He would have said things like, I have great reasons to be an atheist. I don't have good reasons to be a Christian. I have this fundamental understanding about reality that I can have confidence in. I could imagine him saying that to me. It could be the same about any number of atheists in our own contemporary generation, for example. I think of the the late Christopher Hitchens. I think of Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, the new atheist. There is this fundamental idea that when the atheist makes his conclusion, he is standing on the, the solidest ground that he could possibly stand on. Now, Professor Bobbing says this, without God's special grace, the special grace that comes to us centrally in Christ shows us how deeply God can descend to his fallen creation to save it. And here's the idea. In contrast to this idea that we, as rationalistic, scientific-minded atheists, can be confident that we are standing on the best ground possible when we reject God, that is a that is a narrative structure, but is it true? Because what's an alternative? The alternative is, in fact, we have fallen so low that God must condescend to speak with us. And I think that flips script over many of the modern sensibilities. So there is this idea of the self-made person who, who feels that he has this adequacy with which to speak about such things. And when the Bible flips the script on that, one of the things as a Christian, well, well let me tell an anecdote first. <laughs> I have a, a pastor, a friend, who loves to say, people come up to him and say, Pastor, do you need the, the Holy Spirit to get into heaven? And his response is, I need the Holy Spirit to go to Walmart. And of course, that's meant in a lighthearted, humorous way. But there is some truth to that. There, there's another quote-unquote joke that says the Christian life is like three hymns. So when you're first saved, you live day by day. And there's this old hymn called Day by Day, Day by Day and with each passing moment. But then as you walk in your Christian life, you realize that you need God moment by moment. And there's another hymn in our hymn book called Moment by Moment. This is, this is a little bit of a dated joke, Chuck, because th those hymns have fallen out of fashion a little bit. But you've got day by day turning into moment by n moment. And of course, I, I messed the joke up because the second step is I need thee every hour. So you have this you have this progression of hymns. When you're young, you say, Lord, help me day by day. And then you get older and you say, I need thee every hour. And then finally, when you're older, you say moment by moment. And of course, I've blown the joke. But the point is, is we Christians have this special revelation. And what does it do, Chuck? It drives us to Christ in prayer. I'll, I'll say it this way. When I was a young believer, it's not that I didn't pray. Of course I prayed. I loved to pray. But but I, I had a lot going for me, Chuck. I was young. I was handsome. I was healthy. Everything on the body worked good, quote-unquote, relatively speaking. Life was, life was in a situation uh, where I, I really didn't see so many aspects of it. And now, you know, we're 50-plus we're, we're years into this thing called life, in my own case. Chuck, my check engine light has come on. <laughs> I have gone into the shop for major service and repairs, and the people I love in the generation ahead of me are dying right in front of my eyes. And reality looks so much less certain than it did to me when I was younger. And I am on my knees every day in a way that would have been hard to, to me for me to imagine when I was a teenager praying to the Lord. And so Professor Bovink, I think, communicates that it is, it's what we have learned in this special revelation that focuses us that towards that. And so we have that section on salvation as the focal point. Chuck, I feel more and more of my need to be saved as I go on through life and see what happens, not only to me, but to my friends, my relatives, my loved ones. And 
that special revelation drives me there. Let me throw it over to you for some other thoughts in that vein. Yeah, so that uh, that section on salvation as the focal point is is another, you know, really incredible section. And and there were a couple of things that that I I drew out of there that I think are worth repeating. One more general and and one more specific, but that leads to some other things that I over the years have been thinking about. So the more general is he begins this this section on salvation as the focal point by pointing out that from the description that he's given of the content of special revelation, one can infer that it does not consist exclusively in word and teaching and is absolutely not addressed only to the human intellect. So he's saying, yeah, there, there's a sense in which we sometimes think of the written word as being primarily intellectual, right? It, 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 it's meant to really go to the mind and help us to, to learn and understand. And it is through understanding these various doctrines that, that, that we are saved. And Bavink says, no, 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 there's much more to it than that. And as we understand special revelation, and he's, he points out that it consists of some other things as well, theophany and prophecy and, and miracles, and, and we're going to get to that in a moment. These show us that it is about much more than our human intellect. It's about much more than just simply our knowledge that's at play when we deal with special revelation. And so special revelation, scripture, and, and other ways that God reveals himself to us specially are really focused on us as a whole person, as as a unified person. They're, they're really, you know, you know, the whole person has been tainted by sin. And he talks about this on page 345. The, the whole person has been tainted by sin and must therefore also be wholly saved and redeemed by grace in Christ. Error, lies, darkness of intellect are all constituents of sin. Hence, the revelation of salvation ought not to consist only in a communication of life, but also in an announcement of truth that we, you know, this this comes to us not just to our minds, but to our entire beings, our wills, our our intellects, everything. And we, you know, we Bavink is pointing out how how every part of us, how how holistically we need Scripture because holistically we need salvation. It's not just about our minds. And then the other the other thing I just wanted to point at, because it's just something that I will say over the years has has been something that's come to mind on more than one occasion. And and that is his discussion of of miracles. Bavink talks on page 345 about how miracles often serve as signs and seals of the truth of the word, but this is not everything. This is that th- this function, as he puts it, does not all, at all exhaust them. Miracles such as, say, the redemption of Israel from Egypt, the conception and birth, the resurrection and ascension of Christ, each of them has independent significance. They are redemptive acts which themselves bring about certain outcomes and do not serve exclusively as proofs for a doctrinal statement. And so what he's saying here is that miracles, yes, one thing they can do is point us to, you know, the, the doctrine of salvation, but they really go beyond that. They, they have importance in and of themselves because they, they come to us not merely at our intellect, but they come to us uh, at every part of our being. And I was thinking about this. It was actually a number of years ago, and and it, it's and it, I was having a discussion actually at a Wednesday night Bible study at my church, and we were talking a little bit about you know what are miracles and do miracles occur today? And one of the members of of my church who you know certainly falls in into sort of the more Dutch Reformed tradition that that suggests that the the special gifts are you know those. Those are closed since the age of the apostles, right? And the the special gifts of the Spirit, she would say that was meant for a particular time and a particular place. And I'm, you know, I I don't know where I am on that. I I, I tend to believe that generally is, is the case, although I'm not quite willing to shut the door completely on that. But then we talked about what are miracles. And, you know, her her position was there's no such thing anymore as a miracle, that miracles are are done, you know, and we're no longer in the age of, of miracles. And and she based that on this idea that in some ways 
miracles are outside of God's plan, or, or maybe not so much outside, but there's this unusual way or this this special way of, of God unfolding his plan that is different than what he really intends, that it's not really God's intention to work through miracles. And I think Bavink's statement here about how these miracles have independent significance, that they are redemptive acts, I think gives a little more strength to the idea that, no, miracles, you know, however you define them, they are part of God's redemptive plan. And we can argue about whether miracles still occur in this day and age. I, I think they they do, because I think they are part of the way that God reveals himself. Yes, the canon is closed, but God is still revealing himself to us. He's just not doing so in ways that that are brand new. And again, you know, Gordon Spikeman, so this is the second time I'm going to refer to him, but this this is actually the reason I was looking him up again the other day, because I know he, Spikeman has an entire section on, on miracles. And, and, and Spikeman points out that all creational possibilities are God's servants. And so miracles, therefore, don't contradict, but rather open up dramatic ways, the, open up in dramatic ways, the holding and healing power of God's word for creation. He goes on to say later that miracles are therefore not abnormal or unnatural happenings. Such notions presupposes the normalcy of natural law. Rather, they are reaffirmations of the normativity of the good creation order, of God's abiding faithfulness to his covenant promises. Miracles are signs and wonders of God's intended shalom, now shattered, but restored in Christ, a shalom whose final restoration is held up before us as an eschatological hope. They represent manifestations of the future kingdom within present reality. They are forceful reminders of the already dimension of the coming kingdom. And so what, what he's saying is this, is that miracles, which are a form of special revelation, according to Bavink, miracles also fulfill that same role that we have in Scripture. They are they are part of God's plan, not, not necessarily a a broken plan, perhaps a plan that had sort of a, a a detour in the middle of it, but 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 where the end result is still the same. Miracles are a part of God's unfolding that story of redemption to all of us, and and so then when I hear stories of miracles, and and I often do hear stories of miracles, especially in in in, in countries of the global south, it, it it does seem to me when I talk to missionaries. You know, in places like West Africa and places like Latin America, miracles seem to be occurring on a much more regular basis. And and I think that part of that is, you know, the, the, the idea that God is revealing himself, not just simply to tell us, I am God and, and you are a creature, but also to reveal salvation as the focal point of why he's revealing himself to us. Miracles are there to show us salvation. And in some ways, you know, the, one of the things that was that that sort of had me thinking a little bit about that is so then why why is it that we hear about miracles so much more in places like West Africa and Latin America? Those are the places I hear it most commonly, especially in that liminal region between the Muslim world and the Christian world and places like Nigeria and and the Sahel and then in certain places in in Latin America as well. And and I almost wonder are are we not hearing about miracles not because you know there's some special need for them in the global south that somehow well those those people in places like Africa and and Latin America they're just not as sophisticated as western Christians they they, they need miracles I I don't think that's it at all in fact I'm wondering whether it's almost saying that look I've got a special concern in my heart says God about people in these places and so because of that special place in my heart, because I am so concerned about their redemption, I'm so concerned about making sure people hear that message of redemption in these countries, that I am focused on providing miracles in those places so that salvation as the focal point of my revelation can be even more fully seen. And, I, you know, I'll say, I, I haven't finished thinking through all that and what all that means but but that is one of the things that goes through my mind then as as I think about that is is God for some reason even more focused on on those places in the world and what does that mean for us I, I don't think it means that God has given up 
on us in the Western world because God doesn't give up on on his people ever. We know that. But I, but I do wonder whether it is a precursor to something amazing happening in those parts of the world, more so even perhaps in the next in the next phase of history than than in the Western world. I don't know. I, you know, it, it's it's just a thought, but but it's a thought that as I read this section on Bob Inc. and and uh, salvation is the focal point, and and read his paragraph there on miracles, and reflected on what I'd read before in Spikeman, uh, who is always reflecting Bob Inc.'s way of thinking, and what what and Spikeman really does have. He has got seven pages about miracles in his in his systematic theology, which is you know which is not a super long. It's you know, 500 and some pages, and he's got seven pages of it just on miracles. Yeah, you, you, you wonder why, why is that? And what, what is going on there? So that's, th- that was my thinking as, as I was reading that section on, on that purpose of, of, of salvation being the focal point of special revelation. How about you? Is there anything either from that section or even moving on to the Trinitarian glory as goal section that, that you want to, wanted to highlight? Oh, Chuck, that'll preach. <laughs> Thank you. I loved I loved listening to that. And and yes, there there's something that comes from these last two sections. You touched on salvation as the focal point, and then the final section talks about Trinitarian glory as goal. And what is that about? What does it mean God quote unquote gets glory? And why ought that be a goal? Sometimes Chuck people say things that I hear maybe something along the lines of you mean God put us through all of this so that he could get praise and worship? And the implication is, well, that God is somewhat a moral monster, a big meanie who creates all of this suffering, evil and death, simply to be a sort of cosmic Caesar, receiving praise and adulation. There were some video games, a a series of video games called Black and White. I think Black and White, Black and White 2, some expansion packs, in the genre of God game, and the idea in these video games, by the way, concept designed by someone who I believe, pretty sure, is an atheist. And so the idea in this black and white game is that you are the God of your universe, and you you come and, and you start building your praise and worship team, as it were among these Bronze Age villagers. And you have a special spirit animal. You have a special animal who acts as your intermediary, your intercessor, your representative to the people who worship you. And in that black and white video game, you can pick up rocks and throw them at the people if you need them to be afraid of you. Or you can train your animal to eat eat the citizens for not obeying you. So you can you can go down that route, or you can help your citizens. You can, you can bring them rain. You can bring them crops. You can bring them gifts of resources like lumber or wood or, or something else that's useful. And this is where Professor Bovink's thesis about special revelation is so helpful. Remember, we tied this earlier in, and that is to say, if we only had general revelation, how could we distinguish gross error from something that is in fact not erroneous. And there's a a real world example here that I want to bring out. And that is, it's well understood that there was a certain segment of the Jewish population at the time when Jesus lived. And this is a feature of this rabbinical Judaism of the period. And the idea was that there were schools of Jewish religious thought that were supposedly pretty uh, well-versed in the scriptures. And yet, when it came to what, what do we expect from the Messiah when he comes, their idea was, well, we expect someone to liberate us from the oppression we face. And the main oppression in the minds of some was the Roman oppression. And so, when God revealed himself in the person of Christ, and then when that was written down into the Holy Scriptures— the people that had that expectation were completely placed outside of the understanding of God. So God never intended to send his son, the Messiah, down for simply political purpose. Okay, Rome is bad. I'm here. We're going to get you out of this mess that the Romans have oppressed you into. That was never the scope. Salvation is the focal point. 
and Trinitarian glory is the goal. Now, how are we getting the, tr the Trinity out of this? Well, well, let me tie something in. In Psalm 37, it says this, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now, very often people read that verse and think, oh, good, religion is a magic crank. And if I just delight myself in God and turn the crank, then I'm going to get the divine goodies. He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Okay, Chuck, this is it. Chuck, you delight yourself in God, and he's going to build your library. And me, I delight myself in God, and I'm going to get a sports car. Well, that's one thing, one thing that draws people. But the truth is, is there's perhaps an indication here that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. But what what have you just done? You have set yourself intentionally to focus on delighting in the Lord. And then he says, he shall give you the desire of your heart. But that's exactly what's pointed at God. In other words, Chuck, the library is not the point. The cars, they're not the point. It is God himself who is the prize. And he gives himself to his people. And that is beautiful. What does that mean? Well, we understand through the New Testament that that means God gives himself in his Trinitarian form. So the Father, we say, planned salvation. The Son became the mediator and the guarantor of the covenant. And then the Holy Spirit becomes the one who indeed applies the benefit of Christ's mediatorial death to the sinner. And so it is this knowledge that is the prize. Chuck, if I look to the, to the Bible and I want an advantage. Okay, let me see if I can piece the scriptures together to find out what year the, the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to win the Super Bowl. And then that way, haha, I'm going to have this knowledge. And I'm going to go to Vegas and I'm going to place all my money on the Steelers that year. I've missed it. God himself is the prize in all of his Trinitarian glory. And that is so exciting because in the days of Christ, the Jewish people couldn't see the Messiah as the gift of God, when they were looking for the political situation, they were looking for the Romans to be removed. And, and Chuck, how, how similar that can be for us. We can be so focused on social justice. We can be so fo be focused on progressive issues. We can be so focused on conservative issues, conservative value, that we can miss the greater point. God is giving himself, and it's a Trinitarian self. And the person who doesn't find an ultimate satisfaction in God himself as the gift is going to is going to have this issue with the scriptures saying that that's the whole point you know I've, I I've, uh, I'm trying to think which atheist it was and and for some reason the reference is escaping me but I, I remember reading about one atheist who said something to the effect of if going to heaven is simply about doing the kinds of things that Christians talk about we would do up there and that is to say, worship God, enjoy him forever, then I don't want any part of that. And, and Chuck, my only thought is that only communicate with that friend what I think he's missing out on. And so I got a sense of that here from this whole chapter. Let me throw it over to you to maybe build on that for the final section, but also any other last thoughts you had about this chapter. Yeah, I think, I think the, the, to build on that and the last thing that I'm that I'm thinking about here, you know, people may be listening to us at, at any time, but as we speak here, we're in the final week before Pentecost. Pentecost is this coming Sunday. And it's, so it is, to me, really appropriate that Bavink really speaks very much about the power and the role of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we Reformed people are sometimes accused of being the frozen chosen, right? Forgetting about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But Bavink, I think, again, appropriate for Pentecost that's coming, he makes some really key important points about the work of the Holy Spirit here. And he says that the activity of the Spirit is continually needed. And he says that's because Scripture teaches that God's full revelation has been given in Christ, and that the Holy Spirit who was poured out in the church has come to glorify Christ and to take all things from Christ. Bobbing points out the special revelation in Christ is not meant to be restricted to himself, but proceeding from him to be realized in the church, in humanity, 
in the world. The aim of revelation, after all, is to recreate humanity after the image of God, to establish the kingdom of God on earth, to redeem the world from the power of sin and in and through all this to glorify the name of the Lord in all his creatures. Uh, in light of this, however, an objective revelation in Christ is not sufficient. There needs to be added a working of the Spirit in our hearts in order that human beings may acknowledge and accept that revelation of God and thereby become the image of, of the Son. And then he goes on to say, so then in special revelation, everything hangs inseparably together. Now the activity of the Holy Spirit, which is subjectively necessary in human beings to bring them to saving faith in Christ, now can in a broad sense also be called revelation. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, Jesus says to Peter in, in Matthew. And still, Scripture makes a sharp distinction between objective revelation, which includes prophetic and apostolic inspiration by the Holy Spirit, and this subjective revelation, this revelation that, that is here because, in fact, a new light has dawned in the heart of the believer about himself and about Christ, about God and the world, about sin and grace, about all things in heaven and on earth. But it is not a revelation in the sense that it adds a new element, but it is a revelation that comes through the Holy Spirit. And so subjective revelation serves to make this objective revelation known, to have it appropriated by the believer. And for that reason, the activity of the Holy Spirit by which he leads people to Christ is mentioned even in, in Scripture and by other names as well as enlightenment and as regeneration. These are key works of the Holy Spirit. And as Bavink speaks about these key works, works of the Holy Spirit and, and, and how important it is that we have the Spirit working in us. I think it's it's a great way to think about what's what's coming now and what we'll be celebrating in, in churches on Sunday, you and I, which is which is Pentecost, the celebration of the coming of of the Spirit. That was sort of a, a neat way for me to to given the timing to to end up this particular chapter.